Hello, and welcome to the Jazz Pharmaceuticals Four Year and Fourth Quarter 2020 Financial Results Earnings Conference Call. Following an introduction from the company, we will open the call for questions. I will now turn the call over to Andrea Flynn, Head of Investor Relations at Jazz Pharmaceuticals. You may begin. Thank you, and thanks everyone joining the call. Today, we reported our fourth quarter and full year 2020 financial results and provided our financial guidance for 2021. The press release and the slide presentation accompanying this call are available on the investors section of our website. On the call today are Bruce Kozad, CEO, Renee Gala, CFO, Dan Swisher, President, and Rob Yanone, Executive Vice President, R&D, and Chief Medical Officer. Joining the Q&A are Kim Sablich, Executive Vice President, General Manager of North America, Phil Jockelson, Neuroscience Therapeutic Head, Ann Borgman, Hematology and Oncology Therapeutic Head, Sam Pierce, Senior Vice President, Europe and International, and Sean Mendes, Senior Vice President, Strategy and Finance. I'd like to remind you that today's call includes forward-looking statements, such as those related to our future financial and operating results, and which involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual events, performance, and results to differ materially. We encourage you to review statements contained in today's press release and our latest SEC disclosure documents, which identify certain factors that may cause the company's actual results to differ materially from those projected. We undertake no duty or obligation to update our forward-looking statements. On this call, we discuss non-GAAP financial measures. Reconciliations of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures discussed on this call are included in today's press release and slide presentation available on our website. This communication is not intended to constitute an offer to buy or sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any securities or solicitation of any vote or approval. GW intends to file a proxy statement with the SEC regarding the proposed transaction that will be mailed to GW shareholders. You should review materials filed with the SEC carefully, as they will include important information regarding the proposed transaction, including information about JAZZ and GW, the respective directors, executive officers, and certain other members of management and employees who may be deemed to be participants in the solicitation of proxies from GW pharmaceutical security holders in connection with the proposed transaction. Please also review slides two through five of today's presentation for other important information, including where you can find more information on the proposed transaction and on the directors and executive officers of Jazz and GW. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Bruce. Thanks, Andrea. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. 2020 was an exceptionally productive year for Jazz, driven by the expertise, commitment, and capabilities of our organization and defined by operational excellence across commercial and R&D. We enter 2021 in a position of strength. We plan to execute on significant milestones that we expect will further enhance the growth and durability of our business and to accelerate our transformation as an innovative biopharma company. I'm very proud that from this position of strength and readiness, we announced earlier this month that we signed a definitive agreement for the acquisition of GW Pharmaceuticals. We're excited about the potential to add Epilepsies, a third high-growth commercial franchise, to our business, with Epidiolex, a potential near-term blockbuster, as well as GW's robust neuroscience pipeline. The combined company would be a leader in neuroscience with a global commercial and operational footprint, and we expect this transaction to deliver substantial shareholder value. We are excited to be joining two companies with a shared culture built around the same mission, innovating to transform the lives of patients. In 2020, we demonstrated the resilience of our business and our agility, innovation, and execution capabilities across the company despite the pandemic. We launched important new treatment options for patients, including Zepzelka and Zywave in the U.S. and Sinosi in Europe, delivered robust revenue growth, and generated significant value for shareholders successfully advanced early and late-stage clinical trials, and added multiple new innovative products and targets to our expanding pipeline. Our R&D organization initiated regulatory submissions to FDA for JZP458 in acute lymphoblastic leukemia under the real-time oncology review in December, and completed the rolling SNDA submission for JZP258 in idiopathic hypersomnia this month which positions us for two more potential product launches in 2021. Last year, we also continued the expansion of our innovative oncology and neuroscience pipeline 
through internal and external collaborations with a focus on highly differentiated products that are durable and can be effectively commercialized, positioning us to transform patient lives and continue to deliver long-term growth. Highlights of our successful execution on key 2020 objectives include the successful launch of Zepzulka in the U.S. in July 2020, just six months after we acquired U.S. licensing rights, the launch of Zywave in November 2020 for the treatment of cataplexy and excessive daytime sleepiness in narcolepsy. I couldn't be more pleased with our early progress on this launch. The initiation of the European rolling launch for Sinosi in May 2020, the initiation of a new drug submission for Zepzulka in Canada in December, the announcement of compelling top-line results in the JTP258 Phase three study in idiopathic hypersomnia in October 2020, followed by the completion of the rolling supplemental NDA submission to FDA in February 2021, positioning us for a potential launch in the fourth quarter of this year. The initiation of the BLA submission to FDA for JCP458 in ALL in December 2020, with a potential launch in mid-2021, and deployment of capital through multiple corporate development deals to grow and diversify revenues with innovative, new, early to late stage product candidates, such as JCP150 and post-traumatic stress syndrome, and Zepzelka for the treatment of small cell lung cancer. As we think about our key objectives for 2021, we are excited about the potential GW transaction and maintaining the significant momentum of GW's Epidiolex and our Zywave and Zepzelka launches. We also remain on track to execute and deliver on two more important product approvals and launches in 2021 with JCP458 in ALL and JCP258 in idiopathic hypersomnia, while strategically diversifying our pipeline and revenues. As a reminder, both JCP458 and JCP258 are products we've taken from concept to commercial readiness, underscoring the strength of our portfolio and development capabilities. Finally, the foundation we have built across our operations has resulted in a highly productive period of consistent execution and robust financial results and has prepared us for this transformative transaction. I'll now turn the call over to Dan to give an overview of our commercial performance, after which Rob will provide an update on progress across our R&D programs before Renee closes out with a financial overview. Over to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. I'm also very excited about the progress of the launches of Zepzelka and Zywave in the U.S. and Sinosi in Europe. The strong execution across our commercial R&D and operating teams during the pandemic continued to demonstrate our resilience and our agility to advance key corporate priorities while fully supporting our customers and our patients. We're also excited about the prospect of two U.S. product launches in 2021 of JZP458 in ALL and JZP258 in idiopathic hypersomnia. Now starting with Zyram and Zywave, the successful initial launch of Zywave in November last year, which is the first asset we have taken from concept to approval and onto the market, demonstrates our execution excellence across our R&D and commercial teams. Beginning now with the fourth quarter 2020 results, we will be providing you with metrics around the combined Oxybate franchise, including Zyram and Zywave, in addition, we will provide you with a number of patients adopting Zywave therapy. This information is intended to help you understand the growth and the durability of our entire Oxybate franchise. In the fourth quarter, Oxybate net product sales were 455 million, 4% higher than the same period in 2019. For full year 2020, Oxybate net product sales were $1.76 billion, an increase of 7% over 2019. Total Oxybate revenue bottle volume growth was 2% for the quarter and 4% for the year compared to the same periods in the prior year. Through the fourth quarter, despite the ongoing negative impact of COVID-19 on new patient diagnoses and enrollment, average active Oxybate patients increased to 15,300, a 2% increase over the same period last year. 
We are pleased that our initial Zywave launch efforts have resonated well with both HCPs and patients. In the first two months of launch, Zywave generated net product sales of 15 million, and we ended 2020 with approximately 1,900 active Zywave patients. We are confident that Zywave will become the preferred oxybate therapy over time through strong adoption by existing Zyrum patients, reaching patients who have been unable to take Zyrum due to sodium sensitivity, and expanding opportunities with our planned fourth quarter launch this year in idiopathic hypersomnia, which would be the first FDA-approved treatment for this serious hypersomnolence disorder. We remain on track for broad commercial payer coverage of Zywave within the first six to nine months of launch. We've entered into agreements that provide coverage for two of the three largest PBMs in the U.S., with total commercial coverage now exceeding 60% of lives. We continue discussions with other major payers and PBMs. So while we continue to secure additional commercial payer coverage, we do have robust patient access programs in place to help reduce barriers to access or initiation of Zywave treatment. Our market research indicates that the significant majority of HCPs recognize the ease associated with transitioning patients over to Zywave. In November and December, our field sales team engaged with a large majority of the top HCP prescribers, and in December, we also started our direct-to-patient education, most notably with Zywave leaflets added to all Zyrum shipments. We also have begun our Zywave webinar series and have had significant interest in both our KOL-led HCP and patient education programs. So we look forward to continuing the strong launch of Zywave, a very important step forward in Oxybate treatment for narcolepsy patients to support their total health and well-being. Additionally, we are excited to be preparing for the planned JZP258 launch in IH in the fourth quarter this year and the opportunity for continued growth of our Oxybate franchise. We are confident in and we are on track for our goal of having the majority of all Oxybate patients benefit from Zywave treatment in 2023. We set this goal taking into account that patients may have multiple Oxybate treatment uh, options to choose from in that time frame. We believe that as we educate patients and physicians on the lifelong impact of high sodium intake, Zywave will be the Oxybate therapy of choice. So before I turn to Sinosi, I'd also like to mention that we are currently expanding and realigning our neuroscience sales force into two teams to focus exclusively on either Zywave or Sinosi, allowing us to provide dedicated product support and invest in the unique growth opportunities ahead for each product. For Zywave, we will continue our outreach to the top narcolepsy prescribers with a dedicated sales force and reimbursement team to support the adoption of Zywave as a preferred Oxybate treatment. And for Sinosi, we will continue to increase our reach and frequency of calls among the, tr the top OSA treating physicians with a goal of driving significant awareness and uptake among these prescribers. So now turning to Sinosi, during the fourth quarter, Sinosi net product sales were $9 million, approximately approximately in line with third quarter, with full year net revenue for 2020 at 28 million. Prescriptions in the fourth quarter increased 9% in the U.S. compared to the third quarter of 2020. COVID-19 disproportionately affected our Sinosi launch, impairing our ability to build new relationships, especially with pulmonologists, the main OSA treating group, who were also at the forefront in the initial battle against the pandemic. As we move into 2021, we're excited about the investments we're making in Sinosi with our expanded and dedicated sales force and our recent initiation of our TVDTC campaign. We remain focused on driving the next phase of Sinosi growth, which will build on our broad commercial payer coverage at over 90%, the positive feedback and perception of Sinosi among existing prescribers, and the large opportunity of under-treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness in the OSA patient population. And lastly, we're pleased with the pro progression of our rolling launches in Europe 
including the encouraging use of Sinosi in Germany for narcolepsy, which is ahead of our OSA launch expected later this year. Turning now to Zebzelka, we were pleased with our fourth quarter Zebzelka net product sales of $53 million. And this, this is just the second quarter of product launch, an increase of $16 million over Q3. We continue to see significant patient growth and uptake across the community and the academic settings with use in the second line setting in both platinum sensitive and platinum resistant patients. Our education and promotional campaigns remain focused toward the top small cell lung cancer treating physicians. We are seeing considerable interest, positive feedback, and increased awareness across the academic and community cancer centers, reflecting the significant unmet need, the favorable Zebzelka pro product profile as well. So thanks to our team's outstanding execution, this launch continues to exceed expectations. We were pleased in the U.S. hemopoietic stem cell transplants rebounded through third quarter and into fourth quarter, and we also observed robust growth in Europe where our field teams have shared that physicians in select regions are treating the serious complications of bone marrow transplants, including VOD, earlier in order to minimize the risk of patients having to go to ICU. This resulted in fourth quarter defatilio net product sales of 55 million, 16% higher than the same period in 2019. 2020 defatilio net product sales were 196 million, an increase of 13% over 2019. While intensive therapies have been affected by COVID and the entrance of new therapies, we continue to believe in the growth opportunity for Vixios, both in terms of our ongoing development activities and continued expansion into new markets internationally, as well as our ability to return to in-person promotional activity and continuation of our education on the importance of this clinically meaningful improvement seen as highlighted in the recently presented five-year survival data from the pivotal study. In the fourth quarter, Vixios net product sales were 31 million, 2% below the same period in 2019. 2020 Vixios net product sales were 121 million, approximately in line with 2019. So turning now to asparaginase, in the fourth quarter, Irwin Ace net product sales were 57 million, 3% above the same period in 2019. 2020 Irwin Ace net product sales were 147 million, or 17% below 2019. Our agreement with PBL terminated at the end of 2020. We have the right to sell certain Irwin Ace inventory post-termination, and we expect to distribute this inventory during the first half of this year. Given the urgent need for a reliable and high-quality recombinant asparaginase, we remain focused on bringing JZP458 to market as quickly as possible. Our commercial team is currently preparing for U.S. launch, which is targeted for mid-year. In summary, I'm extremely pleased with our overall fourth quarter and 2020 performance. Last year was highly productive for Jazz. We clearly demonstrated our expanded capabilities and the ability to execute across our operating teams. Highlights include the successful launches of both Zepselka and Zywave. I'm proud of the agility and resilience of our teams have shown to support the programs, the products, and patients throughout this very challenging past year. We look forward to continuing to execute and meaningfully advance our pipeline and commercial programs through 2021, with a particular focus on our ongoing launches and following FDA approval, our two planned launches for JZP258 and JZP458. I'm now going to turn the call over to Rob for an update on our development programs. Rob? Thank you, Dan. In the fourth quarter, we continued to make significant progress across R&D, including initiating the BLA submission of JCP458 under real-time oncology review for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and lymphoblastic lymphoma, initiating the rolling submission SNDA submission of JZP258 in patients with idiopathic hypersomnia in December with completion of this submission this month. 
We've also continued our efforts in geographic expansion for key products, including Defitelio, Pixios, Sinosi, and Zepselka. I'll start with an update on the progress in our neuroscience portfolio. Starting with JZP258, we are looking forward to the presentation of our phase three study results in adult patients with idiopathic hypersomnia at an upcoming medical conference in second quarter 2021. We're excited by the compelling study results we observed and look forward to sharing these data. Under fast track designation, we prioritize the rapid initiation and completion of the rolling SNDA submission to FDA within approximately four months of announcing our top line data. As we work to bring JCP 258 to patients with IH as soon as possible, a debilitating disorder for which there are no approved treatment options. Turning to JCP 385 for the treatment of patients with essential tremor, a progressive, irreversible, and chronic debilitating disorder that profoundly impacts quality of life. In 2020, we completed our healthy volunteer study, and we anticipate initiate, initiating our phase 2B trial in mid-2021. Moving now to JZP150, an irreversible thaw inhibitor, which we were initially invest, investigating in post-traumatic stress disorder. We plan to initiate our phase two study in late 2021. I'm excited to get both JZP150 and JZP385 into important clinical trials this year and move a step closer to helping these patients who suffer significant impacts to their quality of life and for whom there are limited current treatment options. Now turning to our oncology development programs and starting with Zipselka, we are continuing to work on the development program for Simselka in combination with, in collaboration with PharmaMar to support robust data generation in combination with other therapies in small cell lung cancer, as well as in other tumor types. We are working toward the 2021 in, initiation of a phase three study evaluating immunotherapy plus lirbonectadine as maintenance therapy compared to immunotherapy alone in patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer after induction chemotherapy. Following the results of the Atlanta study, we and our partner PharmaMar met with the FDA and shared the top line results. We and PharmaMar agreed that Atlantis would not serve as the confirmatory study and are actively engaging with FDA to determine the required confirmatory study package. We're also working with PharmaMar to continue evidence generation on Zipselka. We anticipate initiating a phase four study with Zipselka in mid-2021 with an objective to provide additional data and information on treatment practices, patient characteristics, and real-world efficacy and safety. Finally, we submitted the new drug application to Health Canada in December 2020. Now moving to JZP458, a recombinant Erwinia asparaginase for the treatment of patients with ALL and LBL who have hypersensitivity to E. coli-derived asparaginase. In December, we initiated the BLA submission to FDA under real-time oncology review. We are on track and working closely with FDA to complete the BLA submission and remain focused on bringing JZP458 to patients as quickly as possible. We are targeting a mid-2021 launch in the U.S. We're also working on our regulatory strategy in Europe and Canada and working with our partner on the approach in Japan. We anticipate the data from our current development program for JZP458 will support our efforts to seek approval in Europe and Canada, and we will be confirming these plans with regulators later in the year. Turning now to Vixios, we have submitted data to health authorities in the U.S. and in Europe for Vixios and relapsed refractory pediatric AML. We anticipate a potential approval in Europe and a label update in the U.S. in 2021. While pediatric patients represent a relatively small percentage of total AML patients, as the average age of an AML patient is 67, there is a critical need for more effective therapies in this setting. 
I will now turn the call over to Renee. Thanks, Rob. I'm very pleased to share our financial results for fourth quarter and full year 2020, which reflect considerable top-line revenue growth, including a meaningful contribution from our recent launch of Zepselka. With our strong financial and operational performance in 2020 and our planned acquisition of GW Pharma in second quarter 2021, we are poised for substantial future growth. In addition, the transaction will accelerate and enhance our revenue diversification goal, positioning us to deliver more than 65% of our total 2022 revenues from products launched or acquired since 2019. 2020 was a great year for Jazz. Total revenues for the fourth quarter increased 14% to $666 million, and for the full year increased 9% to $2.6 billion, $2.36 billion over the same periods last year. Our full year 2020 revenue growth was driven by robust double-digit growth in our oncology portfolio and high single-digit growth in our neuroscience portfolio. Neuroscience net sales for the fourth quarter increased 6% to $463 million, and full-year revenues increased 8% to $1.79 billion compared to the same periods in 2019. Full-year 2020 growth in neuroscience was driven by continued notable performance of Xyrem despite the pandemic, growth of Sinosi prescriptions, and the initial launch of Zywave in November. Oncology net sales for the fourth quarter of 2020 increased 46% to $196 million, and for the full year increased 18% to $554 million compared to the same periods in 2019. 2020 oncology sales growth was driven by the robust launch of Zepzelka in July 2020, which generated net sales of $90 million in its first two quarters on the market, and the continued growth of Defatilio, partially offset by the decrease of Irwin A sales due to ongoing supply disruptions. Turning to operating expenses, as we moved through 2020 and assessed the impact of the pandemic, we balanced our investments in the business and focused on key value drivers. Our 2020 adjusted SG&A expense was 33% of total revenues, an increase compared to 2019 of two percentage points, or $112 million, driven by targeted investments to support our multiple new and planned 2021 commercial launches. We increased our 2020 adjusted R&D expense by $32 million compared to 2019, as we expanded our robust and productive R&D pipeline with new innovative product candidates and targets. As a ratio of total revenues, spend was in line with 2019 at approximately 13%. We are pleased with the business progress made in 2020 as a result of our disciplined approach to capital allocation and strong operational and financial performance, and we remain excited about the opportunity to deliver continued growth through our innovative and expanding neuroscience and oncology portfolios in the future. Turning to guidance, for our 2021 guidance, I'll provide JAZZ standalone guidance, and we will update this to include the previously announced GW transaction after it closes. Starting with top-line financial guidance, our total revenue guidance is in a range of $2.55 to $2.7 billion, which represents a double-digit 11% increase at the midpoint over our 2020 total revenues. In neuroscience, we are providing net sales guidance in a range of $1.785 to $1.885 billion, which, which reflects an increase of 3% at the midpoint of the range compared to 2020, and reflects our expectations of the robust adoption of Zywave and for 2021 Sinosi performance 
supported by our investments to accelerate growth and adoption of both products. With regards to Zywave, as mentioned previously, we are pleased with the strong initial adoption. As we work towards broad payer coverage over the first six to nine months post-launch, our investment in patient access and bridging programs is helping to enable seamless access to Zywave by patients. The temporary impacts of these programs, which are important to the long-term durability and growth of the Oxibate franchise, are reflected in our 2021 neuroscience guidance. For our oncology portfolio, we are providing 2021 net sales guidance in a range of 715 to $835 million, which represents an increase of 40% or $221 million at the midpoint compared to 2020 and reinforces the confidence we have in this growing product portfolio. Our oncology sales guidance reflects the impact of the first full year of sales for Zepselka and our expectations for continued momentum in that launch. Anticipated Irwin Ace supply for the first half of 2021 and the planned launch of JZP458 in mid-2021. Now turning to our expense guidance. We were pleased with our operational excellence in 2020 and our ability to navigate the impacts of COVID-19 while still making investments for future growth. As we move into 2021, we will continue to prioritize our investments to drive our key objectives of growth and diversification. Our 2021 adjusted SG&A guidance range is 905 to $945 million, which represents 35% of total revenues at the midpoint. This increased investment reflects our continued prioritization of the launches of Zepselka, Sinosi, and Zywave, and the planned launches of JZP458 in mid-2021 and JZP258 and IH in the fourth quarter of 2021. On the adjusted R&D front, our 2021 guidance is in the range of 330 to $370 million, or 13% of projected revenues at the midpoint, which is consistent with 2020. With our exciting and differentiated R&D pipeline, we believe these investments will continue to fuel sustainable long-term growth for our expanding and innovative portfolio. Our guidance for non-GAAP adjusted net income and APS are in the ranges of 915 to $985 million and 1565 to 1685 respectively. Our adjusted net income as a percentage of total revenues will increase to 36% at the midpoint, up six percentage points compared to 2020. Turning to our balance sheet, in 2020, we generated $900 million in cash from operations and ended the year with cash and investments of $2.1 billion. We are excited about the potential GW Pharma transaction and see this as a transformative deal that is consistent with both our overall business and capital allocation strategy and effectively leverages our strong financial and operational position. As, as we've mentioned, the transaction is expected to accelerate our double-digit top-line revenue growth and BEPS accretive in the first full year of combined operations and substantially accretive thereafter. At close, we expect the pro forma company net debt to EBITDA leverage ratio to be approximately 5.4 times. And given our significant cash flows, we expect to reduce this to below three and a half times by the end of 2022. We view this investment as a disciplined and productive use of our capital to significantly expand our growing neuroscience portfolio and drive substantial value for our shareholders. Finally, we set out an ambitious range of transformative objectives for 2020 and 2021. We are well on our way to executing on five important product launches 
and diversifying our portfolio and revenue base with products to address significant unmet medical needs and transform patient lives. We are looking forward to the planned close of the GW Pharma transaction in the second quarter and leveraging the combined talents and expertise of the JAZZ and GW global teams to develop and launch differentiated therapies to support often overlooked patient populations. Upon close, we look forward to creating an innovative, high-growth global biopharma leader with an enhanced product portfolio, providing the scale and expertise to reach and transform the lives of more patients around the globe with unmet needs. Thank you for joining us today, and I'll now turn the call over to Andrea. Thanks, Renee. We kindly request that you limit yourself to one question during this call so that everyone has an opportunity to ask a question. We will gladly address any additional questions after the call, or you can re-enter the queue. So with that said, please go ahead and open the line for Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you will need to press star then one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Again, that's star one to ask the question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Jessica Fye with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for taking my question and for the color on the Zywave launch. I was wondering if you could say how many active patients are on Zywave currently. Uh, Jess, this is Bruce. Um, we're, we're not going to give intra-quarter uh, data like that. We will obviously up update again on our next call, but, you know, our, our body language here is we're really pleased with the way launch is going, you know, not just during the first uh, couple months, but uh, as we continue through today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alam Amy Fadil with SBB LaRink. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Uh, sorry, good evening. <laughs> Thanks for taking the question. Um, can you talk about, uh, you know, out of the patients that are on Zyve, can you talk about what pairs have been uh, requiring as a um, requirement for switch? You know, are most of these patients are, are patients that have comorbidities, or are you seeing a fair mix of patients that may or may not have comorbidities? Yeah, maybe I'll ask Kim to weigh in on this one. Sure. Hi. Um, so, you know, we're very pleased, obviously, with the uh, progress that we're making here on the launch. Our focus here on the launch is on uh, transitioning Zyrum patients uh, to Zywave. Uh, we really are seeing that the vast majority of those patients are experienced on Zyrum uh, in terms of the patients that are on Zywave, but, you know, both in terms of having just taken Zyrum or have taken Zyrum in the past. But we also see, um, you know, a portion of patients who are new to Oxibate overall and, 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 and new to Zywave. So I'm um, very pleased that it's, you know, consistent uh, with our strategy. And I think, did you have a, a question about payer coverage and just trying to clarify that? Yeah, so with regards to the payer coverage, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, how you're placed on the plan and, and what might be certain criteria that payers are requiring physicians to address before allowing patients to switch from Xyrem to Zyve or a de novo patient being allowed to go on Zyve. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think as you know, we've stated we've had basically a parity strategy between Xyrem and Zyve, both in terms of our pricing strategy and our uh, goal of pricing not only at the gross level but also at the net level. Uh, the two products at parity, uh, but also in terms of how the two products are treated ultimately on, on formulary. We're looking for Zywave to be placed on formulary in a comparable position to that that Zyrum enjoys today. Um, and, and within that means also not just where it sits in terms of the tier, but how it's treated in terms of um, utilization management. And, and so far to date, we're very pleased to say that 
um, you know, with the contract we signed, we, you know, we are uh, achieving that goal uh, of parity treatment. Okay, and if you don't mind, just a final point on that. Out of the patients that have been switched to Zyve up until the end of the year, can you talk about whether or not, um, you know, all that, the mix of patients from that subset that may have, you know, other, other cardiovascular comorbidities or not? Yeah, Dan, maybe yeah. I'll ask you to weigh in on that one. Yeah, yeah, th thanks, Sunny. Uh, yeah, just we're, we're positioned and we're actually pleased with the uptake in the offices that are adopting that really all patients who are on Oxidate therapy, lifelong treatment, modifiable risk factor, you know, whether or not they have current uh, comorbidities, they're at risk of it. And so we're seeing kind of a, gro a broad cross-section of patients uh, we're also seeing, you know, some new patients obviously coming on where, you know, the suite of access services uh, enables and the rising payer coverage with more than 60% of uh, commercial lives covered, you know, coming on to Zywave initially for Oxibate therapy versus Zyrem. Uh, and we also think over time we're going to find patients who had previously not been candidates uh, for Zyrem coming into therapy as well, um, in addition to growing into the IH indication. So, you know, very pleased with the uptake. Uh, you know, certain physicians were further along in the journey at the at the time of launch and understanding the risk factors and the amount of sodium in Xyrem. Some uh, uh, some physicians were not, and also the patients become an active part of this dialogue as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Gerberi with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, thanks, and thanks for taking the question. So, uh, Bruce, appreciate the commentary about uh, favorable body language on the Zywave switch. Uh, what I was wondering is, is, is the switch trending ahead of your expectation? I know you put out some metrics for where you expect it to be in 2023, but just curious if you're, you're operating ahead of expectation or if we should consider there to be a pent-up bolus. Um, you know, I, I would assume maybe only 20% of patients I've seen probably their doctor since the switch occurred, so I'm, I'm a little surprised how high the number was. So just curious if you can uh, provide any commentary there, because I think that would help us think about the progression over the course of the year. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we're Jason, we're still early in the launch, but, but to directly answer your question, we are ahead of the expectations we had set internally uh, for the first couple months. Um, you know, and I think as you heard Kim and Dan comment, our, our messaging is resonating with people about the benefit uh, of this therapy and excitement about it. And so, you know, I don't think of this as a, just a bolus that adopted early. We see continued interest uh, and look forward to, you know, continuing our educational efforts over the balance of this year and next and continuing to work toward our goal of this being you know, the primary brand in the Oxibate space, even out in 2023. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ken Kessator with Cohen. Your line is open. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Bruce, it, it, as we stare at the Zyrum and Zywave franchise, it's kind of a really fascinating modeling exercise as we kind of look at 2023. Obviously, you have Zywave, which could be taking a, a vast majority of the franchise. And then you have information about the settlements and who can come and the kind of the volume they can supply. And you also know the royalties that they owe back to you. So as we look at 2023 and we try to take all these individual pieces of kind of significant conversion to the franchise and then your knowledge of uh, what could be the generic supply for, for Zyrum and, again, what they owe you, can you help uh, qualitatively maybe talk through a little bit of um, either any enthusiasm you have or how we can start thinking about um, maybe a preservation that some of us have modeled a, a little bit too negatively. And then I just wanted to follow up on commentary you made on uh, Irwin A's in 458. I, I, I would assume that you all understand uh, the supply that you're not um, able to, to put into the marketplace. I, I would think that information is almost perfect. So can you maybe give us a sense of what we are unable to supply and therefore what we may be able to supply with 458. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And maybe I'll take the first part of the question around Oxibate and ask Dan to weigh in on asparaginase 
Um, in terms of Oxidabate, you know, the way we're thinking about this is we've got a great growth opportunity in front of us. We're seeing uh, continuing growth in diagnosis uh, and initiation of therapy on Oxidabate. You know, that's a continuing a trend we've had for a number of years now. Uh, we see an opportunity with Zywave to address uh, some patients whose physicians were unwilling to start them on therapy historically due to the high sodium load. Uh, we see an opportunity, obviously, with idiopathic hypersomnia uh, upon the approval and launch of that product later this year, and that's a substantial opportunity relative to the size of the narcolepsy population. So, you know, we, we see growth opportunity in front of us. You know, in the, as you go out a few years, we do expect there will be, you know, authorized generic uh, competition beginning in 2023. Uh, or potentially earlier in some circumstances. And as we've disclosed, we have economics, uh, in some cases substantial economics, in those authorized generics, which we distributed through our REMS. Um, but to be clear, we think that most patients in this lifelong therapy uh, in this group known to have high cardiovascular risk will benefit uh, from the advantages of Zywave therapy. So we see you know, the opportunity to expand uh, the product and then really to be a continued preferred treatment uh, far out into the future. Dan, do you want to take asparaginase? Sure. Yeah, Ken, on your question about asparaginase, I mean, we don't have perfect information in the sense that uh, we've been supply constrained for, you know, four years, and probably last year was our worst year in terms of uh, supply capacity to uh, the U.S. market. Uh, and so as that happened, we've you know, cut back completely on promotion and uh, ISTs and clinical work. Uh, we've also put in sort of patient-by-patient -patient verification for uh, product supply, so, you know, no inventory sits on, on the shelves at the uh, hospitals. And we haven't sort of penetrated into certain new geographies like Japan or, or really helped with the promotion of, you know, asparaginase-containing regimens for adolescent young adults. Um, so, you know, before we were supply constrained, we were moving, you know, above $200 million in product sales. That was several years ago. You know, we believe there's substantial room for, you know, expansion with, uh, you know, a high-quality, fully recombinant uh, product that uh, physicians can count on that when they start the course of therapy, they can get to the end of therapy and ensure the, the really successful treatment outcomes that they currently have with asparaginase. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Balaji Prasad with Barclays. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for taking the question. Uh, maybe just on um, Zyram, with the pace of conversion that we are seeing, uh, Zyram may soon become, become a moot point, but wanted to get an update on Avdel. It's been two months since they've filed. What is your strategy now? And uh, if FDA accepts their filing, uh, is there any way for you to still mandate that there be a para-4, considered a para-4? Uh, how do we think about uh, the impact of this, especially next year? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the questions. You know, we, we're not going to do any disclosure on behalf of Avidel. They'll keep people posted on, on where they are with FDA. We'll remind you that we do believe they should need to paragraph 4 certify against Orange Book listed patents on Xyrem that have to do with the safe distribution of the drug, both as regards uh, our, our distribution system, which ensures uh, safe use of the product and limits abuse, misuse, and diversion, as well as uh, helping patients understand an important drug-drug interaction. That paragraph four certification can happen on submission, but it can be required at any point uh, during the review process as well. And then, of course, we, we have uh, what we believe is relevant intellectual property, and we'll defend that uh, in the best way possible for Jazz. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Randall Sanicki with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Bruce. How are you guys thinking about total oxidate volume growth for 2021, and specifically, we're hearing from physicians that there's an expectation of a, a big pickup going forward in, in Oxbate patient volumes. And I'm, I'm trying to understand if that's consistent with what you're expecting and then how much of that would be uh, related to the lifting of COVID headwinds versus, you know, the 
onboarding of new high-risk patients coming into the patient pool, um, or even just you, you being out there more aggressively educating physicians uh, around Zywave and and detailing the product. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I'll start, and then I'll ask Dan if he wants to uh, to add. You know, in general, Randall, I'd say, you know, this is a, a really exciting period for narcolepsy patients with, uh, you know, the additions to Xyrem as a standard of care, uh, you know, the addition of Sinosi as a new weight-promoting agent, Patolasant coming to market, now as iWave coming to market. You know, there are treatment options that weren't available before. There are more people out talking to doctors about appropriate diagnosis and treatment options. And that's good for patients. And, you know, if that leads to either more diagnosis or more treatment, that would be really helpful since narcolepsy is still an underdiagnosed and undertreated disease. Uh, in terms of our growth expectations, we know that COVID-19 had an impact. Uh, we think that impact is lessening as we move through 2020. And we, like the rest of the world, are, are hopeful that, that 2021 will turn out to be uh, a better year in terms of patients being able to uh, access medical care and get get appropriate treatments. We're excited to be promoting a, a, a new product, and as we head toward the end of the year, look forward to a launch and an indication with no currently approved therapy. Dan, any color you want to add? Yeah, I just to add on to what you're saying, I'd say, you know, persistence and compliance is something we did see pick up during COVID, but the headwind was, of course, uh, the diagnosis of patients, and that's been definitely impacted again in the fourth quarter with uh, with COVID. So, uh, and and narcolepsy still remains pretty underdiagnosed. Uh, the other thing in terms of growth will be uh, just patients as they're becoming aware of the treatment option, whether they had tried Zyrem and come off or hadn't tried it before, knowing uh, there's sort of a longer-term, healthier treatment option. Uh, I think the patient will. Uh, play part of the journey, and, and reaching the patient is going to be important to us. Um, and then lastly, I would say there's, you know, patients who clearly were uh, salt-sensitive and not candidates who now Zywave uh, provides a therapy for them, and also significant expansion into the idiopathic hypersomnia market where there's no FDA-approved drugs, and the managed care has made sure that, uh, you know, Oxybate has not been widely available for those patients. Bruce, are you able to share a volume growth number? Uh, no. So we, you know, we provided a neuroscience uh, net sales guidance for the year, which you know has the puts and takes of Zyrem, Zywave, and continued Sonosi growth both in the U.S. Uh, and XUS. But we're not giving a, a you know specific volume uh, growth expectation. You know, obviously, as we move out into uh, the very end of the year and next year with a successful IH launch, we expect that there's opportunity for the kind of volume growth we haven't seen in recent years. Got it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Gary Knackman with BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Um, I just thought on that last question, up to two kinds in the are you preparing to send these into the market? So, how you plan to Thanks. So, Gary, unfortunately, that was garbled. I, I was trying to pick out enough words that I could answer a question that was related to what you asked, but I'm not sure what you asked. So, uh, I don't know if there's yeah, a way me, to get a better you, connection. Could you could you hear me now? That's better. It's any better. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just anything I potentially see in the guidance and just how you're preparing to launch the indication into the market. So now that you've had a lot more time to think about the overall opportunity, just give us a better sense of of how you, how you're going to be going after that once it's. A I know you were asking about the launch. Was that uh, was that idiopathic hypersomnia or JCP four fifty eight? No, it was, it was idiopathic hypersomnia. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm sorry for the connection. That connection. Yeah, just yeah. Now that Stammer, you've had more time Stammer to think about it, the overall opportunity, and and if it's yeah. in the guidance for this year, 
if there's anything baked into the latter part of this year once it's approved. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll start with uh, the last piece, which is there would be very little in our guidance for uh, 2021 because the launch would be happening toward the very back end of the year. Um, you know, it'll take a little while to build awareness, um, uh, as you know, as you're seeing with the launches of uh, Sonosi and Zywave, you don't necessarily have perfect coverage day one. So I wouldn't think of it as a major revenue contributor this year, although we'd love to get some patients on therapy. Um, maybe we could just ask Rob to jump in uh, for a minute and just talk about, uh, Rob or Phil, just talk about idiopathic hypersomnia as an opportunity from a medical uh, standpoint, uh, and then Kim, uh, maybe a, a few reflections on launch. So why don't I uh, have you go first, and, and I'll, I'll join in as needed. Uh, great. Thank you, Rob. Yes, yeah, so, so I think as we've uh, you know, understood this population more and more, we clearly understand that this is a chronic uh, disabling disease, and these patients have a lot of uh, not only excessive daytime sleepiness, but also a lot of dysfunction uh, you know, as a result of that excessive daytime sleepiness have a lot of sleep inertia. And I think we've talked to you about that before. They have a lot of difficulty waking up um, and have very long sleep periods in many cases. Um, as we've understood this more and more, um, and we see the benefits uh, from our OEDO study, we, we recognize that we can treat many of the symptoms um, you know, associated with the, this chronic disabling disease. From our uh, claims databases, we're aware, as I think we've shared before, that we have about 37,000 patients uh, from claims databases, but we've also heard reports from a number of key opinion leaders who are also prescribers of the narcolepsy population that they see a large number of these patients uh, that have ranged, uh, you know, from anywhere from a, a, you know, up to a similar number, uh, from anywhere, I think, from 10% up to 80 to 90 percent uh, of the of a similar population in size to the narcolepsy. So we haven't uh, completed all the epi data around this. I think we'll continue to do that. We just know what's in the health claims databases. We think it's going to be a sizable opportunity. And I think when we have a chance to share all of the data at the upcoming meeting uh, that Rob alluded to in the uh, in the uh, second quarter of this year. Uh, the, the data is really compelling and I think will be uh, resonate very well with the uh, prescribing population uh, for this target population. Yeah, and just to pivot quickly over to uh, launch planning, uh, we've got a team ready to go. Obviously, you know, significant overlap with the physician audience. We've already got relationships with and are educating about uh, Zywave therapy. Uh, you know, we think there's a significant number of underdiagnosis, but the current diagnosed patients from a chart poll was 37,000. So, you know, that's a big opportunity to start with. And then very importantly, we do have our uh, clinical data from the phase three that has been accepted at an upcoming medical conference in Q2. You know, really pleased at not only having statistical significance, but really clinically meaningful data in terms of the endpoints. And you know, that will be shared uh, six months ahead, and that's great as part of the medical education in advance of the fourth quarter launch. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Anselm with Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Um, thank you. So um, just another question on um, on. IH. Um, so the contracting that you have in place right now, is that going to um, apply uh, to uh, IH patients? I mean, it just maybe give us a, a, some clarification on how broadly ap applicable those contracts are as you think about the, the IH launch. And then a longer-term question is, you know, with the uh, orexin agonist in development, how do you think about um, – the potential impact on the footprint of oxabate in general to the extent that one or more orexins get commercialized. Thank you. Yeah, David, on the first part of the question on contracting, you know, we've certainly done our contracting with a view toward the evolving narcolepsy treatment uh, landscape. 
Uh, but to your question narrowly, uh, you know, we do need an approved label and to have conversations with payers about uh, about that before we're done. So no, it's not a, a fait accompli. And then on uh, on Erexin, maybe I'll ask uh, Jed or Phil to just weigh in a little bit about uh, the potential of Erexin vis-a-vis -vis Oxibate. This is Jed. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, uh, I think it's uh, fair to say that uh, everyone is excited about the uh, potential for Erexin agonist to be um, helpful in the treatment of narcolepsy. The mechanism of the Erexin agonist is substantially different from the mechanism of Oxibate, and we anticipate the Erexin agonist will likely um, have an impact, a uh, pharmacodynamic impact that's similar to what we see with weight-promoting agents and stimulants. Um, and um, so we expect that long-term those agents would be complementary to um, those uh, potential Erexin agonists would be complementary to Oxibate um, in, in treating uh, narcolepsy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Gilbert with Troy Securities. Your line is open. Thanks. I hadn't thought to ask Jed a question, but since he's got the mic, maybe you could offer any thoughts you have on cannabinoids and sleep. I'm guessing you have some thoughts there. But um, my other question was for Renee. Um, when you close the uh, GW deal, do you provide updated guidance um, right uh, on the back of that or the next um, scheduled quarterly conference call? Maybe you could just set the stage for us on what and how you will guide. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I think in the, interest, it, on, in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest we not take the cannabinoid and sleep question right now. We'll have, you know, more to say about the uh, combined neuroscience pipeline uh, at closing, but I'll let Renee take your guidance question. Yeah, thank you. And as you can appreciate, uh, we're still working through um, getting to close of the transaction. And so once we actually close the transaction and are actually running the business, then we'll have a much better feel for the timing of the guidance that we'll provide for the combined company. We will certainly provide updated guidance to reflect Jazz combined with GW post-close, but the exact timing of that is a little early to say. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Reisinger with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Thanks very much. Um, so <clears throat> management had hosted a, a very compelling call on the risk of high salt intake last year, and it seems logical that um, most doctors and patients would uh, – opt for Zywave instead of Zyram, and that should potentially drive a faster-than-expected switch. Um, but my question is, how would you characterize the risk of potentially triggering an early Zyram generic entry in 2022 uh, before you have, uh, you know, a full year to drive Zywave adoption in idiopathic hypersomnia Obviously, the current assumption is the IH launch occurs at the end of 2021, I believe, and then the generic entry against Zyrem is in uh, January of 2023. Uh, so if you could just provide some perspective on that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, good question, Dave. And, and you know, let's just say we want to help as many uh, narcolepsy patients as possible with Zywave. Uh, we are not holding back uh, in any way. Uh, if we're so successful that we've triggered our earlier AG entry, that is a success scenario from our standpoint in terms of our progress with, uh, with Zywave. You know, specific to the IH launch, uh, we did our studies with JZP258 or, or what's on the market as Zywave, and the IH indication would be specific to that product. 
Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Brandon Folks with Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Congratulations on another good quarter. Uh, maybe just changing gears a little bit here and focusing on Deb Stolker. Um, another good quarter there. You, can you provide some color in terms of, you know, how much pent up demand are we still seeing in third and fourth line versus pure second line? And I know you mentioned that both platinum sensitive and platinum resistant are growing and you're seeing usage. Any way to pass that out a bit more just in terms of the uptake uh, between sensitive and resistant? Thank you. Yeah, for Zepzelka uh, color, maybe I could ask uh, Kim to just talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of how the launch is progressing. Yeah, sure. Um, so we remain very pleased uh, with the response to the launch uh, among the small cell lung cancer uh, treating community. Uh, feedback to the profile, to the profile, and what they've seen in their patients has been quite positive. And as you see, there we're seeing nice, you know, growth in the product overall. What I can tell you is that we're seeing growth, um, you know, through the through December, the data that we have across all patient types, um, including second line, as you said, and, and both types of second line patients in terms of platinum sensitive and platinum resistant. So I think we're still in a stage where um, you know physicians are getting experience with it and are you know seeing a tremendous unmet need, a strong profile, and and still using it across you know broad spectrum of patient types. Okay, thanks. And are we still seeing usage from third and fourth line patients as we saw last quarter? Yes, through the data that we have, we're still seeing strong usage there. Great, thank you very much. You know, I, I will say our goal is over time uh, to have this become the standard for second line small cell lung cancer treatment and to have patients get it at that point. Obviously, that hasn't been true in the first few months after launch, right, because we're establishing awareness. But over time, we'd expect that second line uh, share to go up and, and therefore to see less usage later. Uh, of course, in second line, we'd expect longer duration of therapy as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Esther Wajabalu with UBS. Your line is open. Hey there, thank you for, for the question. Um, so two for me, one on JZT458. Um, Dan, you mentioned that uh, you're, you've been somewhat out of the market uh, with this product. So I'm wondering, um, as you're preparing to launch 458, if you can help us understand how we should be thinking about the launch trajectory compared with, uh, with where Erwin A sort of left off or leaves off in the middle of the year. Dan, you want to take that? Yeah, I think I'm going to punt on that question. I mean, we're going to give more uh, detail as we've got precise launch timing and launch label and, and frankly also know, you know what's the uh, asparaginase market look like uh, in the U.S., but we do see, you know, opportunity for growth from where we've been clearly, um, you know, across all the categories I referenced. But I'd say stay, stay tuned a little bit longer on anything more precise. Okay, and then uh, for 385, uh, you've talked about tremor, essential tremor, as, as an attractive opportunity, Bruce, before, um, and, and I think you just mentioned on the call that you've had some phase one healthy volunteer data, so can you give us some context of the data that you've produced for 385 versus what, uh, you know, what's been in the public realm in the past? Yeah, so Phil or Rob, do you want to jump in on that? Sure, I'm happy to, Bruce. This is Rob Um The proof of concept phase two study was conducted, um, you know, before the acquisition. It was done with a formulation that was fit for purpose. And so our initial steps was to develop a once uh, daily formulation that could be commercialized, and that's what we refer to as the healthy volunteer study. And that uh, will uh, be taken forward into the pivotal phase 2B study that we referenced earlier. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Steinberg with Jeffries. Your line is open. 
Thanks. Um, I know you've taken a, a several questions about the Zywave switch, but just want to see if we can get a little more granularity. So if you take the number of patients um, that were on Oxibate therapy that you gave out at the end of the year, as well as those you mentioned were, in, were active Zywave patients, you get about a 12% switch rate. And I know it's not that because you, you mentioned there were some newer patients who've come in. I was just curious on the, on the non-most recent Oxibate switches, um, how many or what, what, what percent of those new patients were just natural evolution of, nar- you know, newly diagnosed narcolepsy patients and, and, and which were, were patients who previously were deemed not, not being able to be on, on, on Zyrum simply because they had cardiovascular issues or comorbidities. And then related to the patients with severe cardio issues, uh, who previously could not be put on, on Zyrum, you know, some of the KLs we've spoken to think there's a very small percent and others up to 20%. I'm just curious, from your own research, what would be that theoretical number of patients who have severe enough CV issues that previously could not be put on, on Zyron? Thanks. Yeah, Dave, a couple good points there. You know, you keep using the word uh, switch. I would just remind you that we, as as you said in your question, we've got patients coming to Zywave, in some cases directly from Zyrum, in some cases from prior Zyrum, in some cases new diagnosis, in some cases their, their physicians may have not felt they were uh, good Oxibate candidates with the high sodium product in, in the past, uh, even though they were diagnosed. And so it's a variety at the beginning, as we would have expected prior uh, to launch. We are seeing a majority of the Zywave starts come from patients with Zyrem experience. That's not a surprise to us. On the exact size of the opportunity of patients who didn't receive Zyrem historically because of those concerns, I'm not sure we have any better hard data to give you other than it's a significant population. Um, but we, we see, like you do, uh, varied estimates in that, and there's no precise way to track that. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Annabelle Samimi with Stiefel. Your line is open. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my question. So um, I just want to uh, ask about the Biselka for a minute. Um, I know that you have to do a confirmatory trial and that you're still in discussions with FDA. Is there any um, color that you can provide on a type of trial that you might consider um, for Zepselka, uh, whether it be combination or um, or anything else. And then on um, the sodium oxabate franchise, obviously the pricing um, parity has helped, uh, I guess, con- accelerate contracting a bit, and you're already at pretty at 60%, so pretty good. Do you expect um, this to continue to proceed rapidly or faster than average? And what can we assume for timing of I guess, net price normalization where you're, where you're not providing as much um, patient assistance as, as these these, uh, these payers get the drug on board um, and start reimbursing regularly. Thanks. So I'll take the second question uh, first and then maybe ask Rob to, to talk about where we're going with Zepselka additional study. Uh, on... Uh, on the contracting, when we say uh, we've got contracts in place for 60%, that doesn't necessarily mean all the rest are not revenue bottles. And I know I used a double negative there, but that doesn't mean we aren't getting paid for some of the others. It's just we don't have contracts uh, in place. Um, and, you know, our goal at the time of launch was we said within six to nine months of launch, launch was in November, we still feel comfortable with that. Uh, you know, sooner is better, but we want to put in place sensible contracts. So it's it's quality over speed to make sure we've got good access for patients going forward. Rob, you want to talk about Zepselka? Yeah, I would just mention that we so far have only had a very uh, preliminary discussion with FDA where we presented the Atlantis data, and we expect to have a more meaningful discussion on what's, what would constitute a confirmatory data package uh, sometime in, in 2Q. Uh, so no further details really to offer on that. I would say that, um, you know, we have disclosed that we're very interested in evaluating Nepselka in first-line extensive stage small cell lung cancer, and that would be 
uh, a switch maintenance design where we'd be adding on to existing therapy. So in the maintenance setting, it would be an immunotherapy plus or minus the Celca versus immunotherapy um, plus placebo, for example. I um, also would you. mention that we are, um, we do have an observational phase four study that's intentionally designed uh, to gather additional useful information uh, in the second line indicated setting. Great, thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Craig Savanis with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. Congrats on a, on a really nice quarter. Um, maybe um, I'll ask a different question that has to do with um, your BD strategies going forward. Clearly, the last 12-plus uh, months or so, you've executed on a number of, of nice deals, and it's kind of changed the trajectory of, uh, of the top line. Um, and with that in mind, given the size of the GW acquisition, um, what should we be – thinking about in terms of BD and whether it's a priority um, over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, you have, you know, a quite robust pipeline and you're integrating a, a fairly significant acquisition, so we'd love to get any color there. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, Greg, this is Renee. I'll take that one. So, you know, Granite, the uh, GW transaction is a meaningful transaction for us that we're very excited about. We've talked for a while about the potential opportunity to do a transformative transaction to be able to accelerate our strategy. And we've um, lined up financing that we think still gives us adequate flexibility to both invest in our important product launches, invest in our pipeline, and then invest in additional business development transaction for the right assets. Um, we still see plenty of opportunities to continue to add to expand the pipeline, both in neuroscience as well as in oncology, because um, you see we have quite a few things we brought into the pipeline, and we want to continue to focus on bringing in both differentiated assets and then building a durable business. Thank you. Our next question comes from Milana Vakash Tawari with Wolf Research. The line is open. Hey guys, thanks so much. Um, on Zywave, have you heard anything back from the FDA on your application for orphan drug uh, exclusivity for narcolepsy? Uh, and additionally, if you do get the ODE, um, what would that mean theoretically for the Avidol product? Uh, additionally, do you have any uh, updates on your once nightly program? I know uh, it looks like your phase one trial should have read out by now. Thanks. Yeah, so no particular updates on either. Uh, as you know, FDA does not have a particular clock they're on when it comes to ODE, so we're waiting to hear on that. That should become public uh, once it's uh, decided, uh, and I won't speculate on impact on Avidel. You can ask them that question, uh, and I forget the second part of your question. Oh, oh uh, once nightly. On your once uh, nightly. So, yeah. Yeah, so we're, uh, we have not said more about our once nightly development program, although it continues. Got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ronnie Gal with Bernstein. Your line is open. Hey, good evening, and thank you for fitting me in. Uh, Bruce, I wonder if you can share with us whether the payer agreements that you have on uh, Zywave and Zyrem uh, give you a preferred position versus other Oxibate drugs. And then to the extent you choose not to take that one, I was wondering if I can ask you about the share of prescribers who have not used Zelka yet. Yeah, so on the first one, we're trying to ensure patients have good access to what we believe is a really important treatment option in Zywave. You know, in general, that means we want them to have reasonable uh, ways to get treatment with appropriate diagnosis and in some cases, uh, you know, having tried other therapies. But it, essentially, it's not different from what we've had with Zyrem for a long time. And then on Zepzelka, um, you know, happy to have any of my colleagues jump in on uh, for those 
docs who have not yet used Zepselka in second line, uh, what your expectations are there. Thank you. I'm showing no further questions in the queue. I will now turn the call back over to Andrea for closing remarks. Thank okay, you, and maybe, thanks maybe all for joining just, us. Maybe just before ahead, I flip it back to Andrea, just to say, uh, you know, thanks to the team at Jazz for really an incredibly productive uh, 2020. And I hope all of you on this call take away that 2021 looks like another exciting year with lots of product launches, lots of clinical progress, uh, excitement about the GW transaction and what that can mean for Jazz for patients, for employees, and for our shareholders. We've got a lot ahead of us and hope to continue executing exceptionally well. Andrea? Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We'll be participating in the upcoming Learing and Cowan virtual conferences, and we hope to speak with many of you then. This concludes our call. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now do